Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Profitable Practice Podcast. Today is a really important one and I hope that you can listen to this in its entirety. Um, Try not to take breaks. Listen to it over again because quite honestly this is probably one of the most foundational elements of being successful in practice and that's talking about our money mindset. This is really what breaks down those that are going to be successful versus those that aren't going to be successful. And I can tell you probably one of the things that I look at when I reflect on my journey as a healthpreneur in the naturopathic industry was when I graduated, I did not let money become part of the conversation in getting my business up and running and um, achieving the goals. And anytime there was an opportunity that came up, I was never hesitant to dip into my line of credit to um, get the finances for it, whether it was my book or a new piece of equipment or creating a website. Like I, I really did my best to allow the conversation of money to not be something that was negative and just say, I know myself, I know how much I want this, I know how bad I want this, it doesn't matter what it costs me to do this, I know I'm going to pay it off and use it to help benefit my patients and my practice. So I thought of no better person to bring on than Megan Walker. She was on um, the Profitable Practice podcast early on in my career. I think she was one of the very first interviews that I did. And um, she has just been such a a pillar in the naturopathic industry, at least um, in Canada especially. Um, And she was she, we had a really, really honest conversation around the idea of abundance and allowing money to come to you. And this is, we talked about everything from setting up your rates to understanding your purpose to doing this hairy, scary goal of actually putting your numbers down on an Excel spreadsheet and seeing, okay, this is what my fixed costs are. This is where I want to be in my practice. I want to be working X number of days, but still um, make X number of dollars every single week or month and sometimes just breaking it down is so important. The other most important thing that we talk about in the interview is the dialogue that we're having with our patients and this is something that I definitely um, would like to do more with my coaching clients in my course Maximize Your Clinic. I do have an audio recording of how I go through my initial dialogue with my patients and exactly what I say to kind of create that therapeutic space but I do feel that that is probably where a lot of us just are not doing our best work is being confident in what our services are and being confident in what our treatment protocol is and understanding that your whole role as the practitioner is to give the patient all of their options so that they can make an educated decision. It is not your job to um, hide testing or treatment options from them for fear that you're going to be told no because you might be told no. But if you don't give them the opportunity to say yes or no, you're really doing them a huge disservice. So by listening to our interview, Megan and I talk about the dialogue and how Practitioners, especially new, um, become so self-conscious about what they're actually worth and what their value is. And so I strongly, strongly recommend that you listen to the entire interview again and do the work that we talk about in the show. Um, Before we jump into the interview, as always, I just want to uh, let you know about the course that is sponsoring this podcast. It is my seven-day detox program, a completely done-for-you program that you can find on my website maximizebusiness.ca forward slash seven the number seven day detox program and this is something that has literally transformed my clinic I do it with almost every single new patient at least once out of all of my protocols I get the most recurring revenue from this um, particular program and it is tremendous in its therapeutic value we have been able to bring people from you know feeling a 
aches and pains every single day, all day long, to having 80 to 90 percent improvement um, in uh, a week or two after doing the detox. So I would never put together a program that I just kind of threw together for you. I implement it literally daily, and I can tell you even right now I have five detox powders waiting for patients to pick them up. So again, that's maximizebusiness.ca forward slash seven, the number seven day detox program. But without further ado, let's jump on the call with Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on the Profitable Practice podcast for the second time. It's my pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. And just in case there's some new listeners that aren't familiar with how amazing you are, please just give a brief kind of synopsis on, you know, what makes you such a bad mamma jamma in the naturopathic community. Yeah, I, uh, I've been in practice for 10 years now as a naturopathic doctor, and uh, I've always had this balance between an interest in business and uh, practicing naturopathic medicine. So I, I've always had my practice, and I consider that a practice on a few levels. One, a practice for patients, but two, a practice in terms of what works in business, what doesn't work in business. So uh, I've been involved in a few startups along the way. I consult in other businesses, and primarily my patient population at this point uh, are entrepreneurs, in particular female entrepreneurs. So I say that I work with entrepreneurs and go-getters, um, which led me to launch my podcast, which is called the Anthropology Podcast, uh, and a really cool online incubator for practitioners uh, called The First 18 to get practitioners up and started through the first 18 months of practice. And congratulations on launching both of those things. The podcast is fairly new, and I've already been seeing some wonderful comments about the show. So that's why it's also a privilege to have you back on today, because there was one podcast episode in particular that was talking about abundance and money, but it was more the mindset around it. And right. um, that's something that I know a lot of us, especially as we're getting started, we graduate with a ton of debt. Um, there's pressure on us to be successful and the uh, yeah. patient or the patients, the naturopathic uh, doctors that I work with personally, you know, that seems to be the common theme. Like some of them are relying on their parents still to help them, you know, pay for things. And there's always this sort of um, pressure in this uh, almost like being stuck in a wheel about, well, how, how do I make money? And we get so focused on the dollar that I'm really glad that today we're going to be kind of talking more about you know, the psychology of abundance and the mental emotional side of that. So why don't you kind of talk about where that kind of comes into play with entrepreneurs and why that's such an important thing that I think more important than anything else is number one, allowing abundance to occur Mm -hmm. because a lot of us put those money blocks in place. Um, But why having a better connection with money and abundance financially or otherwise is so important. Yeah, well, and I want to say too, because I think we beat ourselves up as practitioners and we go, oh, I have so much debt. And, and, you know, I really want to help people and helping people is incongruent with making money. And so I've got, to, we tell ourselves all these stories about why um, as practitioners or as naturopathic doctors in particular, we have, we have money issues and abundance issues. But, you know, I have this really unique vantage point in my practice because I work with entrepreneurs. And so what I can tell you is that anyone who is self-reliant to drive their own income goes through periods of doubt with respect to money. So this isn't unique to this particular population. This is anyone who has integrity and works for themselves and is in a constant state of, I've got to drive, I've got to drive, I've got to drive, because that's how I, that's how I earn my living and, and, and being comfortable in that. So, you know, I work with people with huge businesses and every time they get a big payout from that, they go, what if that's the last payout I ever get in my career? Right? So this is, we see it at all different levels. So I just wanted to, I wanted to normalize that conversation because I think we sometimes feel alone in that. Um, And then I think also understanding the fact that it is our brain that is attempting to sabotage abundance for us. And if we're going to live in a state of abundance, then we need to address what's happening on a physiological level. And we can, we can go there because we're smart people and we understand these pieces, but there's three inherent biases that happen in the brain that keep us from being able to access that mindset required for abundance. The first is that we have this bias towards negativity. So we've, we've evolved as a species to be able to recognize negative things in our environment. And then what we do is we have the second bias called a confirmation bias, where once we like zone in on something being of danger to us, 
debt is of danger to us. It's just mm -hmm. a modern version. Then what we do is we look around and we look for every piece of evidence that's going to reinforce that, right? I had a patient who canceled the other day. My mortgage payment is due yes. in two weeks. I have all of this debt. I'll never climb out. I don't know how to do it. All we do is focus on the negative. And then we have this thing called an authority bias. And the authority bias, this is where someone in a position of authority reminds you, oh my gosh, it's so hard because you have so much debt coming out of school and you have this and you have that. And so you get caught in this, literally it is your primitive brain. It is firing like mad and all it's saying is danger, danger, danger. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, you can't be creative, you can't be inspirational and you can't be your best practitioner self when you are caught in survival mode at all times, which is why I'm so unapologetic about working with practitioners to get them out of that mindset because you are not doing your best work. So if you believe that, you know, I've, I've got to discount myself left, right and center to be able to help as many people as possible, you're caught in your primitive brain center. You're no longer being creative about how you can access more people. You're being reactive. So that that to me is like that's where so much of my work happens is around just getting people out of that that fight or flight mode with respect to their relationship with money. And intel sometimes it's just, you have to intellectualize your way out of it, right? And then once we do that, I have these things called the three Ps of abundance. And so the three Ps lead into one another. And I talk about this with my patients who are entrepreneurs and, and money's, money's an issue for them too. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk to myself about it because we all have moments where we're like, oh my God, gosh, like, what yeah. if that was a fluke? What if that never happens again? What, yeah. if, what if, what if, what if, what if, right? So the first is perspective. And so if you are, if you believe that you're in the bottom of a well, and that your only job is to get out of the well, because that's what you have to do to survive, and all you see is debt and numbers and climbing everywhere, then you lack the perspective of standing beside the well, right? You can still recognize that there's a hole there. You can still recognize that something needs to be done with it to operate safely, but standing in it and standing beside it are two totally different perspectives. And when you shift your perspective, you basically shift your world. But now when you have a shift in perspective, you can see possibility. So if you're in the bottom of the well, all you see is dirt. But if you're on the edge of that well, cognizant of the hole, now you can see this whole new landscape. So possibility is so, we, we've seen this over the course of human history. When we shift our mindset to possibility, crazy things happen. And I've got cool stories we can talk about with respect to that. But we go perspective, looks at possibility. And then the, the last part, and this is what drives abundance. This is what, this is the intersection of abundance with authenticity. And that is truly understanding your purpose. Mm -hmm. and really spending time there. And I ask my patients, second question is, first question, why did you come in my office? And second question, what's your life purpose? And when there's- And that, I get, sorry to interrupt, but no, even no, no, if you would ask me that, I'd be like, oh my God, like, I have no idea. You know, if, if I were in their shoes and you weren't thinking about it, because we run like the marathon of life, right? We do often what we think we are supposed to be doing. And you always hear those stories time and time again of, I knew that this wasn't right for me, but I didn't know what my alternatives were. I had bills to pay. I had this to do. I had that to do. And it's so scary, again, exactly what you're talking about, being in the well, as opposed to seeing everything outside the well is, you know, we get so trapped with, well, this is the path that, this is the safe path. Again, coming back full circle to the danger, danger, danger. And when people start to actually live what their true desire and their true purpose are, it's almost like everything opens up. And then, of course, you allow for the abundance to come back. So I'm so sorry for cutting you off there, but... You're going to have to just keep cutting me off because I could just, I'm like, I'm just an incessant monologue about this. So <laughs> just like jump, just jump in. No, I mean, that's the whole point. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Is that you, you just, ha you have to change the way that you're approaching the problem. You have to get out of the primitive brain and you have to get in and access these higher functions. And that's what makes us amazing to start with like a leverage, leverage all of your neurology, not just the fear-based side of it. But getting over the fear, I think, is probably one of the most difficult steps for people to take that leap of faith and not know if there's a net at the bottom or not that's going to catch you. And I think this, and I wanted to bring this up to you as well, yeah. is this is, I think, where the shiny object syndrome comes into place with entrepreneurs especially. So when you're in that fight or flight state and with 
everything that we're being inundated by, the, the incessant webinars, the incessant online programs, the courses you can take, the new techniques that you can learn, I feel like we get into that place where people are starting to invest their money into everything they see, thinking that it's going to be the next best thing, as opposed to just wrangling it in and saying, no, this is what I'm going to work on. This is what I'm going to get really good at. I'm going to use the tools that I have now and grow from there slowly. Do you see that a lot with the people, patients or otherwise that you work with? And you'll hear, I, and I hear this constantly with mine is, well, I think I'm going to buy this course. What do you think? Or I think I'm going to learn this technique. What do you think about that? And I'm like, well, have you actually used the tools you have already to your advantage? But it's that, you know, it's that next best thing. Oh, this is the next best thing. And everyone's going to sell their thing is the next best thing. So how do you work with people in that instance? Yeah, it's such a good, it's such a good, um, it's such a good point. And, and people get caught, they get caught in because we're feeling people, right? Yeah. And, and especially as practitioners, we're like, oh, we feel, we feel feel debt. We feel love. We feel what our patients are, are going through. So, and that's, that is totally our gift, but we have to be smart about it and we have to hedge against our gifts sometimes to make sure that they don't drag us down pathways. So, I mean, entrepreneurs by nature, they're dopamine junkies and dopamine junkies love to start new things, right? So one, we've got the situation where we're scared. So if a new opportunity comes up, we're like, oh, I'm totally going to take that. And then the second thing that entrepreneurs tend to have is they get totally jazzed when they take new things on. So they're scared and they're like, I have 10 possibilities. I'm just going to do them all. Mm -hmm. And and really all they're doing is chasing the feeling. They're chasing the feeling of security and they're chasing the feeling of the dopamine rush of starting something new. And it rapidly leads to burnout or adrenal fatigue or whatever vernacular you want to use. So when I'm talking with, with my uh, coaching clients around driving business decisions, I have two things that I basically take them through every single time. The first one is, is it smart? So don't start with, I feel like this is a good thing. Let's back up and actually go, okay, cool. Let, well, let's just run the numbers. Let's actually see what the return on investment is going to be when we purchase this new program. It's really cool that you're going to learn how to run seven figure online programs, but you don't actually have any new patients yet. So maybe there's a strategy that we should look at here and we should shelve the opportunity for the seven figure income in the online program world. And we should really focus on lead generation in your practice. Just like you would work with a patient who needs to repair their leaky gut, you're not going to start on like advanced maneuvers and doing maintenance work on their mitochondria when they're still eating like cheesies in the evening right. and, and Diet Coke. Like it just doesn't work that way. So I always ask them, is it smart? And so we can come back and we actually have, have tools to be able to evaluate whether there's a return on investment for that decision or that strategic direction in their business. And then the second question, is it feel, does it feel right? And sometimes I have business people where they're all numbers. And so then we take them always to that second question where we're like, well, does it, does it feel right to do that? Right. It might make a lot of sense for you to take on that defense contract, but if you're now shipping arms over to the developing world, maybe it's just not, does it feel right to you? So I just feel like those two questions always have to be asked together and it can't be one that's more dominant than the other. It's mm -hmm. totally like the yin and yang of business, um, business triaging with respect to strategic decision, decision making. <laughs> Now, one thing that was kind of coming to my mind as, as we were just talking about this is, again, that shift is, is getting people out of the state that they're in to a whole new state. And this is, I find, probably the biggest challenge when it comes to coaching or mentoring just about anyone is they are so in their world and they're mm -hmm. so stuck in their emotions and their feelings that when an independent person like yourself or myself will say, you know what, this is what I think is actually going on based on what I'm hearing from you. It sounds to me like this path that you're on is really like you're resisting it in every way, shape or form, but you're still doing it. And how do you get people to, number one, acknowledge that what you're saying is true? Because often when we are interpreting what's actually going on, just like we do with our patients, they come in with, let's just say, sleep issues. And the real problem is that they're having marital problems that they haven't acknowledged, right? right? So when you're right. like, okay, you're coming in with this symptom, but the real problem is actually this. When we're dealing with entrepreneurs... How do you gently coax them out of that, again, comfort zone? I'm dedicated to this. This is what I think I should be doing. This is what I'm doing. And be like, you know what? 
that's actually not working for you. Let's try this. How do you do that? Because I find that to be incredibly challenging when I'm talking to people. And the best example I can have is I was on a a strategy call with someone and they were talking about how, you know, I really don't like this. I don't like doing this treatment. I really don't like one-on-ones. The only therapy I really like is acupuncture. I'm really not motivated to like go to these, my clinic every day. And I said, and I just said, do you actually think that staying in naturopathic medicine or doing what you're doing is something that you really want to do like what does your ideal work day or life look like and I could feel the tension from my computer how resistant she was to hearing what I had to say not to say that I was correct but the fact that I was kind of relaying my opinion of the situation back to her right it it was just not receptive at all and and again I'm not saying that I was right but that's kind of what I was feeling. So how do you deal with that resistance that a lot of us will have when you say, look, like if you want to be successful in what your purpose is, I guarantee, not guarantee, but I promise you that doing this is going to really benefit you, but you got to try, you got to step outside of yourself and just trust me. How do you get people from that point A to point B? (laughs) Yeah, that's a hard question, Yeah, right? And everyone, everyone's different. And listen, people are invested. You just drop a hundred grand on school and you've made promises. You've made promises to partners, to parents, to grandparents, to your dog. When I am done school, I'm yes. going to set the world on fire. And then you graduate from school and you go, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm doing. Right? So you have a financial debt, but you have an emotional debt and that sticks you right back into that primitive state. And so I I feel like when you really get deep on purpose, like really go there in like a a tingly physiological place and just, just brainstorm and, and get totally esoteric and play around with what that looks like and look at the number. What if we impacted a hundred thousand people in this way? What kind of, what would that do to you? Um, we, we get people out of that mindset because you can't simultaneously be fearful and in a state of absolute possibility at the same time. And so like, usually it means if, if we're online, like we need to physically change how we're talking. So maybe we flip it to a phone call and we're both going for a walk. If we're in person, we go outside. If it's like really deep and they're super stuck, then, um, there's sometimes where I've told people like, you need to go on vacation. We need to talk in 10 days. Like you have to completely remove yourself from this problem and stop trying to fix the problem with the same things that got you Mm -hmm. here, right? You need a new set of solutions. And, and I really believe in actually engaging in activities that change your state for being able to solve new problems. And so that might mean going on vacation. That might mean something as simple as like rock climbing, where every time you let go of the wall, you're just slightly scared that you might hit the ground, like literally change your physiological state and then reapproach the problem in a new room, through a new lens, in a different perspective, so that your 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 brain is not jumping on those same pathways that got you in the problem in the first place. And I would love to hear those stories that you said that we could talk about when you're talking about people going through the three Ps of abundance, so your perspective and how that changed right. the possibilities. I'd love to hear some of those. Well, it's just, it's funny, like, th- there's certainly clinical stories, but the one the one thing I think is just so great is we, we in 1954 in... Victoria, Vancouver, let's just, let's just say BC, um, there was this race and it was the four minute mile and two people broke the four minute mile that day, Roger Bannister and John Landy from Australia. And that was eight weeks after Roger Bannister had broken that record for the first time. And what I think is so cool about this example and this story is that we had literally been working for hundreds of years to be able to break this feat of human accomplishment. Like literally in Spain, they used to stick people on roads and release the bulls behind them and time a one minute course to see if having bulls chase you would like compel you to break this record and we couldn't do it. And then we did do it and we two people did it within eight weeks and there's been like 50 odd people who've broken it since and now we've beat it by like 17 seconds. Right. And so it's this concept of once it's, once we actually know what we can do as humans, as individuals or anyone else, th- we've just, we've like shattered that barrier, right? It's why I think for women it's so powerful to go through that birth experience because you're like, 
bring it on. Like there is nothing I cannot, I cannot handle. Right. It's one example of like those really powerful moments. Um, but I think the same thing happens with respect to, to business for people. And once they realize they can, they can do things once they hit uh, a revenue mark in their practice, once they find that compelling way of being able to speak to, uh, patients where they're like, they keep, they keep booking in, like it can't Mm -hmm. even stop them now. It's just so full. Like there's no going back from that. So sometimes when we're, you know, we're looking at these big lofty goals and we're going, I have to pay back $200,000 worth of debt. How am I going to do that? We need to like break it way, way back into small incremental goals because once you've passed a goal, you can, it's like a crank. You can, you never fall, you never fall back. Once you know, you can hit that and you're confident you can hit it, you never break it. And so we just keep setting things a little bit higher. But I love that Roger Bannister and John Tandy story because like we had literally been working to do this for so long and then it was like, Oh, we can do this. No, and then it no becomes problem. so easy. They, right. Yeah. Right. It's so easy. Like your, your brain and your mind are driving so much of what's happening in your practice. And frankly, in your patients' lives, like we spend thousands of dollars on continuing education to understand the body, which is important. But I really like you want to make an investment, invest in understanding human psychology and what mm-hmm. motivates people. And, and you're not even going to know what to do with the number of people who want to talk to you. Yeah. And, and I was actually thinking of a story again, um, when we were talking about this, about purpose, and this is going back to Sylvester Stallone's story, how he wrote the script for Rocky, and he was living on the street, and went from pitch to pitch to pitch, and all of these movie companies just said no, 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 and he could have easily just been like, well, forget it, like, they said no, obviously this is a sign that I shouldn't be doing this, and then one person took a chance on him, and now look at his success, and he created that, right, there's so many people that have just been so dedicated to what it was that they wanted to do they didn't let the no's stop them from achieving their success and then they just flourished when that one person took a chance on them or when that one big break happened and that was something that I was talking about on a previous podcast about how as entrepreneurs we are expecting phenomenal things to happen way too fast and using the example of um playing an instrument. So if I were to give you a flute and you've never picked up a flute before, it just makes sense to you that it's going to take you a while to learn how to play the instrument, to learn how to hear the tune, to learn how to read music before you get really good at playing the flute. And as entrepreneurs, we hear all these amazing stories of, you know, yeah. first launch, first this. I opened my doors and it was, you know, this. And it happens so rarely, <laughs> but we expect yeah. the same thing to happen to us and we don't take the time to be like, oh, you know what, this is a five to 10 year investment just to get my business going. Um, So have you found examples of that where you're just seeing people that are just like, literally going from just being born into the entrepreneurial world to expecting to run, you know, the Olympic marathon in like a day, and you have to be like, look, like, the most important thing for you to do is get in it and be in it for the long haul. Yeah. Consistency builds the cavern, right? You just don't have one rainfall and suddenly the Grand Canyon showed up. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those people. Like I came out, I was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do it. We're going to do it right away. And it was a constant, it was a constant nuancing of goals. It was a reevaluation. It was coming back to numbers. It was looking at, it was looking at that purpose and it was understanding that entrepreneurship is, is something you're in for the long game. This is not, there's, there's no, there's no quick, fix for abundance. Mm. Well, maybe the lottery, but there's no quick, that's it. That is the only quick fix for abundance. And those odds are way worse than if you want to approach things from an entrepreneurial perspective, like put your money there if that's fun for you, but that's not where it's, that's not where it's going to happen. The magic is going to happen because you consistently get up every day and you go, I'm tapping into my purpose and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to execute and I'm going to move just that much closer to where I go. But it's kind of like the, the line at the grocery store. If you're in line, you're like, Oh, this is too long. I'm moving here. Oh, this is too long. I'm moving here. Oh. Mm -hmm. And and then you realize that the person who is behind you is now checking out where you originally started, right? Like just, you gotta just stick to it. There's a great book by Seth Godin called the dip and it's super short. And this book basically talks about how as entrepreneurs, we start out and there's always this glory period, right? Cause we're just, we're just covered in dopamine and we're feeling so good and we go and we like get one sale and we feel amazing. And then all of a sudden 
we have this we have this dip and the dip is where the really hard work psychologically and time and energy all come into play and what you have to do is you have to keep pushing through and pushing through and pushing through and you have to come out the other side and it's when you come out the other side that's where the glory Mm -hmm. of entrepreneurship happens right it's that I pushed I pushed I pushed and now I've I'm coming through the other side and and it gets easier and the reason it gets easier is because there's all sorts of people drowning in the bottom of the dip they're like forget it I'm out that was I stayed late at work past six o'clock like this is way harder than I ever thought it would be this is hard guys like this is hard but it's like it's like glorious hard. It's like going to the gym. You feel really great and you're helping people. Like I can't think of a better, I can't think of a better way to be an entrepreneur than to get up every day, get to build a business and get to help people. And this is honestly, I would say probably the pinnacle time to really embrace being a naturopath because everyone is looking for it. They're looking to be, yes. um, take control of their health. They're looking to be advocates for themselves. They're looking for the information and they want to look for it from people that have the license and the background and the knowledge to support them. And I think that's something that we just take for granted mm-hmm. that, you know, this is really our time. This is really when things like we're starting to develop controversies amongst other professional um, governing bodies. And that's when you know that we're actually starting to be big players in the medical community, which I think is fabulous. Um, I wanted to take a step back when you were talking about abundance and not discounting yourself and setting up your rates as a new practitioner or feeling confident in raising your rates later on in your career can be a very uncomfortable thing for a lot of people. So how do you coach people around setting up their rates, setting up their value? Yeah. So I kind of love to talk about this because I actually think your, your rates and charging people for what you do is a system of maximizing compliance. So people value what they pay for. And so what that does right off the bat is it changes the psychological lens through which you view exchanging a fee for for your time or your energy or your knowledge or wisdom or inspiration or whatever it is that you're able to offer on a given day. When people don't pay for it, they don't value it the same way. So please give them the opportunity to pay for your services. The second thing I say before we even talk numbers is that the delivery of medicine is expensive. And so the challenge for us in Canada is that medicine has been delivered for free, right? It doesn't matter whether it is or not, right? It's a perception. And so, um, we're up against that, but people don't actually know what the delivery of medicine costs. And so it's extremely expensive for us to go to school, for us to be insured, for us to maintain continuing education. Our knowledge and our capacity to share it in a strategic way is extremely expensive. You need to know that when you're setting your fees, right? Even the, the very second you get your, your degree or your diploma, your information is, is highly valuable. Um, and so you need to price, you need to price accordingly. It is never a good plan to set your rates as a commodity. And what I mean by that is I'm going to just be the lowest person in the community and therefore everyone will want to come right. to me. Right. Now, what people will think is that you're probably not, you're like the worst naturopath in the community is really the psychology of what consumers are going to think. And there'll always be someone who can go cheaper than you. So I have just never, um, in a traditional one-on-one practice model, ever seen anybody be successful by being like, I'm going to be the cheapest, right? That's, it's just, it's just not, it's not going to work. The second thing that people seem to do is they kind of, this is what they, this is literally the psychology. I'm going to kind of set my rates based on what I feel is sort of okay in the middle of sort of my area. And it's, and it's literally that lack of indecision or strategy that they use to approach what their fee schedule is going to be. Well, someone so charges this and they're like really good and have been out for 10 years. And this person, oh, I don't like the chairs in their waiting room as much. So I'm going to I'm gonna land right in between. But what people don't do is stick it in a spreadsheet and say, I'm going to work three days a week and I have this many hours available to me. And my overhead in terms of rent is this and my reception team costs this and my online booking experience for my patient costs this. So it's never it's not, it's not a strategic decision and it's not a business decision. It's a feeling decision. And we talked about this before. You can't make decisions in your business without 
both. It has to feel right, but it has to be strategic. And so, sure, find out what people are charging in the community because you can't be way off base. But then you've you've got to go back and you've got to spreadsheet that out. You've got to understand what your expenses are. You've got to understand what your revenue goals are. You can only charge so much. So then you're going to have to go back and look at your model and see how Mm -hmm. else you're driving revenue in your practice. But setting your fees should be an Excel exercise, not a it's kind of what I feel exercise, yes. right? And you have to look at, okay, here's where I am now. Where do I want to be in five years? Where do I want to be in 10 years? Can I actually, can I change it? What does it look like if I change these? Do I make more money from intakes or do I make more money from, from loading up on fall? Like it's a, it's a really strategic decision. And everyone who, who graduates as an ND has the intellectual capacity to run this exercise because you've done way harder things before. <laughs> yeah. uh, just to put but you in that scary. mindset of possibility. Yeah. It's scary, but it's also amazing. I sat down with someone last Last week and we opened the spreadsheet and she didn't want to go there. Yeah. And we changed we changed our fees because I think most people undercharge what they're for what they're doing. Um and we changed the bottom line by over thirty thousand dollars for her a year. Perfect. Just by playing around with those numbers and we had so much fun. We were we had fun in Excel because we were we were we were playing around and we were looking at possibilities and and we were freeing up time because she didn't have to be in clinic as much. Like Ah, I love spreadsheets. Love them. <laughs> Cuz that's where that's like it's it's where you free up your time. It's and it's numbers, right? Like it's yeah. legit. This is what is going to happen if you see x yes. number of patients and charge yes. this amount. This is what's going to happen. Like it's right. not a make believe number. It's what's right. going to happen. Right. Yeah. So much fun. I totally love it. Now, the other thing that people typically ask a lot about that I see especially on social media and things like that is in my patient room, is it appropriate for me to be talking about prices? Does that take away from the patient experience? What are your thoughts on cultivating that patient experience? Yeah, patient experience is everything to me. Um, and and I talk about this a lot with people. And everywhere we move throughout our, our lives, we're painfully aware, well, whatever, it, like, in a good way, of, of the experience that has been curated for us, whether it is the the labeling on on a scent or a drink or a new food product or how we walk through a store or where they take us, these are highly curated experiences and we respond accordingly. Women notice these things more than men and frankly we treat women more than more than men. So it absolutely matters how you how you speak to people, how the experiences when they walk into their waiting room, when they come into your office. And so, you know, I've, I've owned a big clinic where we've had reception and they have the conversation with people. And now I have a micro practice and, um, we collect, I collect fees directly from people. I keep their credit card in our system because I don't want to have a conversation about money after every visit. I want to finish that visit and give them a high five and have them feeling amazing. And they're like, I'll see you in two weeks. And we book that appointment and, and they're out the door and they know their credit card is going to get charged in 48 hours. And people enjoy that as well. Mm-hmm. It takes the conversation from this high vibration state and we don't have to even worry about having a conversation with respect to money, but any conversation about it, I have up front. So it's also not something that I just kind of like skirt around yes. or don't talk about. We talk about it in the first appointment. And I say to people, I don't work with dabblers. So like if you are here, you are here because you want to change your life and we have a ton of resources online and otherwise to help support that. So know that I'm highly committed to you and know that we're going to be working in a, in an invested way for the next six months and this is what it's going to cost. And I'm really realistic about that up front mm-hmm. because I don't want people three months in before they before they really have significant change to say, whoa, this is really expensive and I haven't gotten any results. So they know exactly Mm -hmm. what it'll cost to work together. The other thing I do is I lay out what their six month plan is gonna look like for them. And I have a fairly standardized approach that changes for everybody. So the strategy is the same, the tactics are totally different. And so I'm able to say to people, this is what it's gonna look like with us working together for the next six months. This is what you can expect. This is how many times I have to see you do physical exams, we have functional testing, we have all of these things if it's required for your care. And then we anchor every part of the experience to that initial dialogue. So no one is ever getting anything and they didn't, uh, they didn't expect. And it, and it actually, it's, it's never a hard conversation. 
and it is something yeah and it is something that I wish they had trained us more when we were in clinic in fourth year is having 10 to 15 minutes to lay out the experience to introduce yourself properly instead of just saying you know what I'm Dr. Andrea welcome to the office what brings you in today like that was the dialogue that we were taught and I can tell you you look across the the table or you just look at the chair where your patient is sitting in and after you've gone through everything and you've been completely and 100% transparent, you can feel the trust. Like it's like they're just yeah. falling into your hands. They're like, you know what? I'm so thrilled I'm here. I, I will pretty much do whatever it is yes. that we decide to do together. Like you can feel that transformation mm-hmm. happen. You can look at their face. They're smiling. They're like, yes, this sounds awesome. And I don't think enough enough of us do that in our practices is set up the experience totally. as you said um and with my patients i every time there is the concept of money i say i'm going to explain everything in the visit i'm going to tell you exactly what the supplements are going to cost what the test is going to cost what it's going to show us so you can make that informed decision so when you do check out there's no mm-hmm. oh did you know that it was going to be this much like were you expecting to pay this much today like there isn't any of that hesitancy it's we talked about it you committed to it now it's on paper you know let's move forward and again right. there's that hesitancy around coming back full circle to the whole point of the conversation accepting money for offering them superior treatment and the other thing that I find mm-hmm. a lot of us do is we make the assumption for the patient that the answer is going to be no Yes. And what do you do in that instance? And I'm sure you've had experiences of that too. Well, and it's not even, well, I agree. We make the assumption they're going to say no. But what we do is we hedge against that assumption before we even have the dialogue by not saying, we're going to run this organic acid test and this is what it's going to tell us and how it's going to inform our course of treatment. And then explaining it, we say, is it okay if we maybe consider running? um, Well, I think actually, well, there's this thing called a food sensitivity test and it's like $500, but I really think it's going to be helpful. Right. Well, I mean like done, we're done. You've completely broken your trust with them. You are hesitant. You're just projecting all your, it's expensive for a new grad to purchase a food sensitivity test on themselves. Yes. It is not necessarily expensive for a well-insured employee who's been working for 10 years to purchase this food sensitivity test when they've had diarrhea for four months, right? Yeah. Like it's, they're coming at it from a different place. And I, I'll often say to uh, new grads when I'm working with them, take me through the dialogue around testing, like literally pretend I'm your patient and tell me how this is going to run. And it's always in the form of a question. Mm-hmm. And so we spend a lot of time actually just dialoguing around that. I said, if nothing else, you need to like incarnate a character who's confident talking about these tests because these tests give, at least for me, they give me extremely valuable clinical information. I never run them unless one, they're warranted or two, it changes our course of treatment. Right. And I say that in the very first visit, if I recommend a functional test, it's because it's absolutely going to inform a new direction with respect to your care. And I'll always tell you what our options are if we didn't run that test and what that parallel plan would look like. And then you get to own the decision. But if there's a way to expedite a result and a change in your health, I'm going to share with you an opportunity to do that and you get to own it. And suddenly whenever I bring up those, those tests, it, it, I'm never, I'm never selling them. Right. I'm, it's, it's just, it's just easy. Like that it is what it is, right? That, that test is, is extremely valuable. Um, and so share that with them. Mm -hmm. Even like treatment protocols, if it's not testing, if you know that there's a treatment protocol, that would be great. And you know, it's going to be a fair number of supplements in the beginning, but there's a strategy behind it. It's, it's your responsibility to at least share it with the patient. And exactly as you said, say, if you don't want to do the full thing, so fine, we can break it up into chunks, we can do it this way. But if you don't give people the the complete picture, you're also doing them a disservice. It doesn't mean that you have to take advantage of them and say, well, based on this seminar, we should be running five tests that are going to cost you five grand. And then you're going to walk home with a duffel bag full of supplements, because that's what I was taught. It's, you know, this is what I think would really work for you and there and as you said it's six months right so we don't have to do everything in the first week we can lay it all out but I find again by 
not giving people the option to say yes or no, we're also taking away, again, our ability to help them and offer our patients the best service. And then we're also taking away our ability to, again, attract abundance because we're too afraid to ask for it. Yeah, absolutely. And when people have good experiences, they're going to go tell their friends. Mm -hmm. The friends are going to come and see you. Like your job is to optimize patient care, period. Yes. That is, that is it. And and the other thing I'll say is I'm I'm coming at this from this just base assumption, which is totally false, and that everyone is practicing with good intention. So when I talk about this and I talk about, you know, if a test is expensive, then I lay that I, I'm always coming at it from a place of of pure intention. And if I'm working with a, a coaching client, I'm only going to work with people who are, are pure intentioned, not people who are like, I just want to find a shortcut to making money. Mm-hmm. And so any of these techniques or abundance or all of these, like this is all coming from a place of, I'm just assuming you are an extremely honorable person doing honorable work. And we just need to shift your mindset about being able to be compensated for that in a fair manner. Now, as we're kind of wrapping this up, do you have any other even um, client stories or patient stories of how they shifted their mindset and then saw tremendous things happen? Oh, gosh. You know, I've had a few I've had a few clients and, and frankly, the biggest transformation with my coaching clients comes when we actually sit down and look at numbers. And it's all theoretical and they get all sorts of ideas leading up to that. And we talk about, we talk about systems and practice and we talk about other things, but when we literally go down and actually plot things out and people go, what? Like if, if, if we just added this type of testing or we were able to do this in our dispensary or we increased our flow of traffic by 20%. I can suddenly do X, Y, or Z, or I, I don't have to be in clinic five days a week. I can, I can be home with my kids. Like, like things are absolutely, absolutely transformational for them. I, I think that's actually such an important exercise to sit down and, and really look at, at the numbers that support the abundance. And I hope everybody does that. And with every show, there's always at least one actionable item. And this is going to be your big, fat, scary, ugly frog action item but it has to be done and I completely agree with you there's freedom in knowing that information but it is very scary to look at it Um, but it's amazing how much easier your life gets when you know what the game plan is and this comes with you know paying your mortgage and all the bills at home this comes with running your business this comes with just about everything so thank you so much again for coming on uh, Megan and sharing your wisdom with us once more. If anybody wanted to get in touch with you personally, what are some great ways to do that? Yeah, I'm always hanging out on social media. So you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Dr. Megan Walker. And if people want to hang out with us and talk business or numbers, um, we're also in my online Facebook group, uh, which is Facebook forward slash groups forward slash the first 18. Perfect. Thank you so much again. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too, Andrea. Thanks so much. So as I said, you have to listen to this interview one more time and really let it sink in that you, once you graduate, have all of the value to offer your patients. You don't need to necessarily be investing in all the shiny objects that are out there that are claiming to be the next best thing when it comes to growing your practice. Um, You just have to really take a step back and have that confidence in yourself to know that at the very least you can offer all of your patients more strategies and um, plans and therapies that they never would have received from their medical doctor or specialist because that's what makes us so phenomenal. So develop that confidence within yourself to set your rates the way they are, to have those conversations around prices, be very frank about it, and just let them know, here's your options. If you don't want to do this, that's fine, but at least you know what exists. If we don't do that, we can do this, but understand that we might not get the results as quickly. So this interview I think provided a tremendous amount of value to you and if you would like me to help walk you through the dialogue or just have an ear to listen to you as you go through this is my intro with my patients or this is how I talk about prices with my patients and you want me to critique that or say you know what I would probably do it this way or walk you through that that's why I'm creating these interviews for you and that's why I put together my 
free 30-minute strategy call. So if you know you need support in these areas, if you know you need help going through the numbers and creating that dialogue, you know, reach out to me. It is absolutely free. There is no strings attached and I am here to 100% support you and get you feeling more confident and more secure in the business that you're creating. So go to my website, maximizebusiness.ca and click on the tab that says work with me and we can jump on a call and we will spend the next 30 minutes together going over anything that you want to when it comes to having the conversation and what would the dialogue look with, look like and what is your pricing strategy we can break all of that down I think you would be crazy not to at least reach out to someone and get that extra advice and that 30 minutes could transform how the rest of your clinic is managed um, this month and beyond so definitely get in touch with me I love hearing from you if there are topics or questions or things that you'd like me to address on the show please contact me I'm on Facebook you can email me at info at the maximmovement.com I'm always accessible to you and then we will see you on the next show. And if you didn't get a chance to listen to Megan Walker's podcast, check that out in the archives, which is on my website under the podcast tab. All the shows are listed there and you can find Megan Walker's show there. Reach out to me if you need the extra support or help. That's why I'm here. I'm Andrea Maxim and I'm out. <laughs>